what's it been now? Two years? Did you miss me? Did you? I hope you did. But some of you probably didn't. But I'm back. If I want to hashtag make wrestling fun again in 2017, you knew inevitably it was going to bring me back to this company. As much as any other company out there, there's always been this kind of sick, twisted connection with me and TNA, Impact Wrestling, Global Force Wrestling, what the hell ever we're going to call it now. This company has always felt like home. Maybe it's because I was there as a day one guy watching and ordering the weekly pay-per-views. Now, 15 years later, 15 years later, this company still stands. Out of defiance, miracles, whatever the hell the case might be, it still exists, and for that, I am thankful. So, unlike a lot of you who are going to comment on this video and probably bitch at me about certain things on this video, I decided, you know what, after 15 years, you earned some sympathy money. I forked over the $39.99 proudly and hoped for the best. I didn't know what I was going to get. Because I had been so disconnected from the product for a while, I didn't know what the hell to expect. I just wanted something. 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 And I will say this. Is that after watching the G1 USA special from New Japan the night before, I was a little bit concerned about having fan fatigue. And comparing this show too much to that one, even though it's two entirely different products, two entirely different brands, two entirely different styles. But thankfully, that didn't happen. All I wanted to do is have something. Something that was good, and also something for me to rant and rave and bitch about. Which was always the formula for success for me with TNA and Impact Wrestling. Well, if nothing else, you got it. So if you're excited, like I'm excited then you know what to do. Subscribe. Hashtag subscribe or die. We're going to hashtag make wrestling fun again. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's talk about Slammiversary 15, bitches. Now, I will say the opening 14 tag match, I could have done without. I didn't know who most of these people were. I didn't know what, if anything, we were actually fighting over or fighting about. These guys seem very uncomfortable in the six-sided ring. The, move, the match was sloppy. It was often botchy. It was some bad Lucha Libre looking very staged, rehearsed, and choreographed. Just not the type of crap I was into. And knowing it, going into this, even for somebody disconnected from the product, that LAX was going to win no matter what, I really honestly could have done without this match. I understand he put them on this card, whatever, but this was not the best way to kick off this show. And this was my initial impression after being gone for, what, two plus years now? It wasn't a good one. So then after that opening tag that I thought was just a complete disaster and a very bad first impression, the reality sinks in that we're going with some third-rate, uh, washed-up NFL player in the next match. And to me, this is just a hearkening back to what TNA uh, Impact Wrestling did so often throughout the previous 15 years. Hype up C and D level people like they were A-listers and they bring you nothing. And that's pretty much what I was expecting out of this tag match was nothing. And I am pleased to report that I was completely ass wrong. Moose is boss. Moose, Moose, Moose. So I had a little reason to care. Some of you had told me beforehand that Eli Drake was awesome. Yeah, for what I saw on this night, you could keep him. And furthermore, it didn't matter because the clear star of the night to me was D'Angelo Williams. He actually took some pride in this. He clearly worked at this. He cared enough to be professional enough to say, if this company is going to put me in this spot and pay me some money, I'm going to actually pretend like I prepared, like I'm a wrestler, and I'm actually going to go out there and try to do something. And he did something multiple times. He was great. He was phenomenal. He was everything you could expect and more out of an NFL player coming in and working his first wrestling match. He was great. The way they featured him was awesome. The way they allowed him to shine was awesome. And even if you talk about the table botch at the end, the dude still came off of the top turnbuckle on top of somebody on the table that didn't break. Man, this match was a lot of fun. Not every match needs to be a five-star masterpiece to hashtag make wrestling fun again. This is the type of stuff that can make wrestling fun again. And if this company is thinking about the future, 
and trying to be contradictory to the WWE in a lot of ways, including the mantra of hashtag Black Wrestlers Matter, D'Angelo Williams showed you enough, if he so chooses, to give him an extended look and give him a job. I'm down with that, and I think after this match, quite a number of other people would be too. And one more time, Moose, 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 Moose. Now, as I said, being so disconnected from this company's product for so long, I wasn't familiar with a lot of the storylines, a lot of what was going on. But there was one match, uh, or maybe two, uh, but one in particular that had piqued my interest the most. And that was a strap match between EC3 and Jane Storm. I'm familiar with both of the characters. I kept up with at least some of the story here. I was down with this. Strap match, EC3, Jane Storm. It just fit. It just made a lot of sense to me. So I was looking forward to this. Disappointed that I was third on the card. But the way this all played out, I'm probably thankful that it was. I thought this match was hitting and hitting and hitting really well. It was doing for me what I wanted it to do, what I needed it to do. I was enjoying it quite a bit. And then the finish happened. And what, However you were planning it, however you thought it was going to come out conceptually, it just kind of fell flat for me. It was building me up and building me up to this point where even if I had an idea and a feeling of who was going to win, and I was fine with that, give this dude an undefeated run at Slammiversary, that's cool. It gives you something to build off of for the future. I was expecting to finish to pop me and have me pumped, give me some feeling of satisfaction. Instead, it gave me a feeling of disappointment, and I know I'm not the only one that ended up feeling that way. The Dick Storm's here, baby, and I don't know about you, but it's great to be back Talk about this company, whatever it's going to be called, once again. And, and I, I don't want to hate EC3 by hook or by crook. Win if you can, lose if you must, always cheat. A win is a win in the record book, baby, and I salute you. But you know deep down that you're not the better man. And I'm calling for an investigation. Why the referee taking the handcuffs off of EC3? He brought the gimmick to the dance. James Storm outsmarted him. The cowboy was about to whoop him like a steer. And the referee gonna get involved. Is he on the payroll for EC3? Is this match only up and up or is this shit rigged? Did they bring in the officials? The scores from the freaking Pacquiao Jeff Horn fight? That's what the dicks don't need to know, baby. There should be an investigation because this is an outrage, an injustice. And believe me, Nobody knows more about justice than the Dick Stone, baby. But that's all right. That's all right. Because we going to have our moment. We will get our revenge. And then James Stone will go on to become the new, whatever the hell you call this company, world heavyweight champion, baby. Woo! Ride the Dick Stone. We going to investigate your ass, EC3. Hopefully some of y'all are happy to see the Dick Storm back because in part it's his push that brought us to this moment in time where the Schleg Daddy's back home where we always belong. But anyways, talking about coming back home. One of those things that I've always seen out of this company over the years, and you've seen it at times with WWE too, is pushing non-wrestlers way above and beyond most of the active wrestlers on the roster. And I've never really gotten it, never really made a lot of sense to me, because where's, frankly, the short-term payoff, and where's the long-term payoff? And this whole story that's been revolving around Jeremy Borash and Josh Matthews, I always thought was just kind of dumb, frankly. It was very reminiscent to me of Michael Cole and Jerry the King Lawler heading into WrestleMania 27. And we all know how that turned out. And regardless of anything, I thought this is the way this was going to go. I thought this was going to be stupid. I thought this was going to be an epic waste of time. And then the match happened. And thank God... I was so, so wrong on so many different levels. So many different levels. It was good to see the Pope pimping baby. Robert Flores and Don West on commentary I thought were solid and on point all night and frankly put JR and Josh Barnett to shame from G1 USA the night before. Let JB and 
Josh Matthews do this match on every pay-per-view if it means we get these guys on commentary because they were top-notch here. At least, if anything else, solid. But who cares about that right now, even though I wanted to make sure I called that out because, God, this match was so fun. This match was so much more fun than it had any business being. And let me say this. There was always that element of getting entertainment value or in a variety of different reasons on the spectrum. Good train wreck doesn't matter when you have Scott Steiner in a business that is so overly scripted from the promos to the television segments uh, to the pre-records to the way we map out matches and we have to plot out all the spots and then everybody's so concerned about these paint by number get all my shit in matches that even if it doesn't matter if it doesn't connect with the crowd we still got to get all of our shit in scott steiner is a refreshing breath of fresh air because everything with him is spontaneous because you don't know what the hell is going to happen with him because frankly I think everybody believes he doesn't know what the hell he's going to do. And my God, it's awesome. And everything about this match fit. It's like you incorporated some uh, total nonstop deletion stuff into here and the broken hardies into here. And I'm okay with doing this in the way they did it because it was well executed. I mean, my God, we've got golf carts and fire extinguishers. Fat asses! We're going to get you fat asses! <laughs> <laughs> we got JB doing flips into a damn pool. Here comes fucking Shark Boy. Here's Father James Mitchell. My God, this was magnificent. This was so fun. And my highlight of the night, I enjoyed it so much that I legit was excited and popped just a little bit when the music hit and out came Abyss. Abyss! I popped for Abyss! That's how fun this was. Not everything has to be flips and kicks and rest holds and all this other technical garbage. Not all this high spot shit. We can do some different stuff. And sometimes different when done right is absolutely incredible. And here this different was absolutely incredible. Man, I enjoyed the piss out of this match. If you watch one match from this show, this has to be it. This has to be it. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. And now maybe we can get back to the business of JB and Josh Matthews moving on from this crap and never bringing it up again and getting back to commentary. Or we could stick with Roflo and Don West and that would be just fine with me too. So after the awesomeness that was that tag match, I felt like I kind of needed a little bit of a, a mental and emotional break just for a little bit. And unfortunately, what filled the gap on this show was this intergender Full Metal Mayhem match. Now, maybe in part of it is that I've never been a big America Wolves guy. I'm not big on Davey Richards or Eddie Edwards or Angelina Love or Alicia Edwards. I, so I didn't care about any of these people. And coming off of the heels of that match, maybe nothing else was going to really engage me or uh, get me interested. So I don't want to totally poon this, but I didn't care about this match. It, it just was a dud to me. Even though... I give them credit, they were going out there and they were going balls to the walls, but if anything else, this match to me fell a victim of its placement on the card as much as anything else. Maybe if it was somewhere else, it would have worked better. I don't know where you would have put it on the card that would have made it better on this particular show, but perhaps that would have been it. Or maybe it was just ultimately doomed to this fate. But again, just because it had a bunch of chairs and all this other bullshit doesn't mean I enjoyed it. In this case... I just didn't care because I kept thinking about seeing Shark Boy and Father James Mitchell and Scott Steiner getting <laughs> sprayed with a fire extinguisher. Talking about they're going to get their fat asses. Can anybody tell me why Loki is dressed up like Hitman? Can anybody tell me? I'm sorry. I just think the dude's a dumbass. I don't care. But anyways, two out of three falls match. X Division Championship. Solid. Again, it probably doesn't help that I'm not a low-key guy. So I really couldn't care. I think he's a dumbass, like I mentioned before. Uh, but these guys at least tried to work. Tried to tell some type of story. You know, low-key did a good job of working that bullshit ankle injury. And, and they, they worked it. And they did very well with it. Um, Sanjay Dutt retained. Hooray which I already knew this was going to happen because I had already seen the results thanks to somebody posting on Twitter because this company freaking leaked it to the TV Guide. 
So the smart ass in me wants to say about this women's unification match that I didn't realize that Finn Balor was a woman's champion for this company. I know. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Go ahead. Flaming keyboard fingers of fire. Engage in the comment section and on social media. But let me say this. Rosemary's better. There. Does that make you feel better? It's a slight towards Finn fucking Balor and that piece of crap. Not Rosemary. Anyways. This match. I'm going to tell you. I really don't remember much about it. I really don't. Um, it was, if anything else, overbooked. That's what I remember about it the most. We've got people out there, then they're not, then they're running back out there and they're getting involved in all this crap and we have them hit with the title. This was not a favorite of mine because for me, being not familiar with Rosemary and Sienna at all, at least if anything else, this match and the way it was booked gave me an indication of who I'm supposed to like and who I'm not supposed to, which is cool, but... I didn't need this overbooked piece of crap because this was one of those things I remember TNA and Impact Wrestling being notorious for and not in a good way. And it wasn't good to see it here because I felt like it took away from it. Maybe for others it didn't, but for me, it took away from the match. You know, at this point in time in the show, I'm like, we still got a main event left that feels like a big fight. There's been some really good and awesome on this show. Some other stuff not so good. But enough that made me glad that I watched on Sunday night, that I forked over the $39.99 for the pay-per-view, and looking forward to the match to come. Nothing could ruin my buzz at that moment. But of course, it's like this was done intentionally. It's like this was done just because they knew I would be watching. Just couldn't help them. Fifteen fucking years, we're still doing this song and dance. Oh, I got something for you. I don't get to it, but it's not! But of course, the founder, the Memphis Midcourt piece of crap, just fucking Jarrett, just couldn't let this night go by without one more excuse one more opportunity to sit there and pat himself on his back and soothe his massive fucking ego. We didn't need him come out and pandering to the fucking fans. We didn't need him sitting there and talking about any goddamn thing because after all, who wants to hear Jeff Jarrett on the mic? We're again talking about Jeff fucking Jarrett. But no, he's had to sit there and claim victory and talk about 15 years later. Nick Foundry's back 15 years later. It's still about this asshole no matter what. It's bad enough early in the night. We just had to work in carriage Jarrett. For what reason? Who fucking knows? Who fucking cares? Because they had nothing to do with this goddamn show. We have to sit there and pander and say, oh, thank you. And we would be nothing without you. Why? Did you feel the impact zone with all these people that became gold members of Global Farce Wrestling? And it makes me sick. As much as I couldn't wait for TNA to change its fucking name, to the fact that it's now going to be named after the second Jeff Jarrett Vanity fucking Project Global Farce Wesley. This is ridiculous. The fact that this guy felt that we needed him to interrupt the flow and the momentum of this show in any goddamn way and making sure one more time, because again, he's the fucking founder of this egomaniacal son of a bitch Memphis Midcard piece of crap, broke 10,000 guitars, never drew a goddamn dime, sit there and say, and even though that's the main event, I'm still the face that's run this place. Well, I got news for you, Jeff Jarrett. Fifteen years later, it's time to take a back seat. It's time to stay behind the scenes. Man, I know deep down you're fighting that urge to go after that new Unified Global Force title, but if you do, I'm going to be there every step of the way. You suck. You always have sucked. You always will suck. And fuck you for taking this spotlight away and taking this time away from the goddamn main event for no fucking reason. Oh, and most importantly of all, fuck Jeff Jarrett! Alright, let's tell the truth. A lot of you just clicked on this video waiting for that. And it felt good. And truth be told, for me, it felt real good. And wherever there's a founder Memphis mid-card piece of crap, just know that the Schleg Daddy will always be there to drop the truth bombs 
and fight every step of the way against this glory hog, this egomaniac, trying to get that next world title push. But on to the world title unification match. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the fact this felt like a big deal. With both guys having entourages in there, that was awesome. That's what you associate with the big fight. Not every main event of a wrestling pay-per-view feels like a big fight. Feels like a big deal. Feels like it's actually a main event. This one did. Then you look at the fact you got a black dude who's serious as shit. He doesn't dance. He doesn't rap. He doesn't do all types of suspect shit. Have flames shooting out of his ass. I appreciate that. And then you got a Mexican champion who's booked seriously. He's not sitting there and saying essay and Holmes and Vato. He's not talking about his low rider. He's not doing any of that crap either. He's just a wrestler. A black man versus Hispanic man. You book them both seriously. And these guys actually feel like fucking main event wrestlers. How refreshing. And it made this whole match refreshing. Was it a five-star masterpiece? No. Did it need to be a five-star masterpiece? No. It felt like a big fight. And it had moments where it was a big fight. And they did some big fight stuff. And I loved it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Which was all I was asking for here. Now as far as Alberto El Patron... Winning the title, I'm still trying to fight. Not saying Alberto Del Rio, and frankly felt like he was, and other people were throughout the course of the night. Winning the belt, well, he came in with the GFW title. You had to feel like he was going to win it. And if anything else, you should have known, because the results have been leaked earlier on in the day on the internet, because the fucking company had released this shit to the TV guy. Unbelievable. How stupid. But it still didn't impact, I spun, my ability to enjoy this match. It was a... Good culmination to a good night. Was it perfect? No. Was this a great pay-per-view? No. Would this be something I would tell people to go out of their way and watch all of it? No. i tell them to watch this match. Um, I would tell them to go back and watch the D'Angelo Williams match and then the JB Josh Matthews match. But man, compared to what we get out of wrestling a lot today, this was good. Enjoyable. And it felt good to be back home. So I'm so glad to say that I'm staying home. I'll be watching Impact this Thursday and every Thursday going forward. And you best damn believe I'm going to be reviewing it too. Because it's time to hashtag make wrestling fun again in 2017. And with me coming back home, it's a big step in the right direction.